we learn how to live with this animal and to protect them. That forced us to be in love with this animal. We protect them all from our heart. That's why when we are here, we feel free. But we know we put ourselves in danger. Our planet and our civilizations are changing faster than ever before. Join me as I travel the globe talking to startup founders using technologies to make our world more interesting, accessible and livable. These are the entrepreneurs that are creating the future we will live in. This is Now Go Build. The natural world is in trouble. Wildlife populations around the world have declined more than 60% in just the last 40 years. And recent research tells us that a staggering 1 million species are at the risk of extinction in the next few decades. Nature is fundamental to the development of human society. The conservation of our natural world isn't just a nice thought, it is an imperative. Our ability to grow a healthy, economically and socially sound world demands that we live in a balanced ecosystem. It is because of technology and science that we've been able to pinpoint our need for the natural world and the human pressures that are threatening it. It is science, technology and education that will bring us back into balance. South Africa is home to some of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. I traveled a few hours north of Cape Town to the Aquila Nature Preserve to visit Africans founder Paul Penshorn and to learn more about his vision to connect all of us to the natural world. Hi, my name's Paul. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Pleasure. You have a good trip? Absolutely, yeah, it's good. Great, well, let's go on safari and go find some animals. So, Paul, tell us a bit about uh, what is Africam? Africam is Essentially, it's, it's a network of live streaming cameras that we put at waterholes strategically around Africa. What we really want to do is try and connect people from around the world to the wild animals of Africa. But what's, what's the motivation behind it? So why are you doing this? Is this purely some, uh, some TV show? Through being involved with Africa, and we've seen the power that the emotional connection to animals can have for conservation, for education. and. Part of the process has actually been trying to find out where exactly we, we sort of fit in. Live streaming is, is very different from edited pre-programming content. I mean, that must be, must be an important part of, let's say, validating the efforts of the, of the NGOs. For sure, you know, people trust life because you can't manipulate it. So when it comes to sort of um, raising awareness and funding, we found that live streaming is way more effective. And again, I go back to the fact that 60% of people donate once they've watched a live stream. And that percentage is under 10% if they've watched a video. Mm. And that's purely because live is unscripted and it's, and it's trusted. Yeah. The old business model was money going to sort of hierarchy NGOs mm -hmm. who would then feed down to the grassroots NGOs. But because of poaching, there's been an explosion of the grassroots NGOs. Okay. So there's just not enough funding. So what we're really trying to do is just enable the funding to go directly to the NGOs because times have changed. You know, you're kind of seen as a um, bit of a shady person if you're making money out of conservation. Yeah. But the, the fact that the um, poachers are a complete commercial outfit, NGOs actually need a commercial model for them to compete. It's awkward to see that many people don't believe that non-profits can go very well hand in hand with a commercial model. Yeah. That's, that's what you need to be, build a sustainable business. This is a typical example of, of the camera that we use. Yeah. And in fact, this is a typical example of a sort of location that we would sort of choose. It's normally a water hole that's sort of high traffic where the animals come, okay. come to drink. Where do you mount it? You put it in a tree or you have a sort of a rack for it? We try and sort of um, create different user experiences. So 
Where there's a hide at the water hole, we put it on the hide so that sort of user experience is that you're sitting in the hide looking at the animals. Hmm. We've got another one called Cat's Eye where the whole idea is that it's at the level of the animals. So when the animals come down to the water hole, you're at their eye level. So it just creates a sort of different user experience. Okay. But a big factor is just to try and keep it away from the animals. Your two main enemies are the elephants and the baboons. The elephants come and if, and if they sort of get upset by the camera and by the movement and the noise, they'll just come and destroy it. Okay. So often we put rocks around our installations, which you'll see, and for the baboons, we just make sure that everything's protected and covered because they have a knack for coming and destroying things as well. This is another one of our installations on the Naledi, Naledi Game Lodge. It sits right on the banks of the Ulifanch River. It's one of our most popular cameras purely because it's very remote. It, that does sort of make certain challenges, but uh, we've now set up an infrastructure where we can beam out live HD footage using point-to-point -point radios, beam it onto the top of a hill called Marikis Corp, and then down into a town called Hoodsprate. From there, we go onto the um, fiber and straight into AWS servers. So the cameras are also remote controlled. It's not just a one-way thing, is it? No, this is, and this is the amazing part. You know, AfriCam's got a global community of people who just want to help. So we've got a, um, a group of people called Zoomies, and they operate the cameras 24-7, and they move them. If there's any sighting, they press a button, and you get an alert. You can either get it by email, via social media, or onto your iPhone. Um, you can swipe and start streaming and watching, watch the sighting. When the sighting's finished, they press stop, and it cuts a video highlight, and that goes onto our website, or it can be sent to you daily as well. And they do it sort of out of the kindness of their heart, and we're extremely lucky with this community, and they help us out tremendously. Okay, so once an animal comes online, let's say there's a leopard by a water hole, what's the typical explosion of sort of viewers that you get? In South Africa, we talk about something called bush telegraph, you know, yeah. how the word gets around. And bush telegraph also works online. So if a lion or leopard come on, we send out the alert fire. Yeah. But we see huge spikes in, in traffic, you know, we'll get sort of tens of thousands of people sort of coming online. Okay. And um, the cameras have evolved hugely over the last three years. Um, the camera technology has allowed us, you know, with the, the sort of streaming algorithms have improved and the compression mm. algorithms to really stream full HD from the bush to any device around the world. But also with um, the, the advancement with infrared, we've uh, uh, up to 50 meters away, you can see the, the vein on a leopard while okay. it's drinking at a water hole, which is amazing. And that's the kind of quality that we need to deliver to a global audience for people really to sort of get that feeling and make that connection. One thing we really focus on is the sound. Yeah, because sound is actually one of the biggest sensors that sort of transports you somewhere. So you know, we get a lot of people in America who um, put the sound through their sound system and put the TV up. And it's, you know, it's, it's a great experience. And we, we used to run video ads sort of every five minutes. Yeah. And you know, people sort of turn the sound up and they're listening to the sort of calls of the of the wild and the next thing is sort of commercial for soap comes on and I get about a thousand emails of people complaining. So we've taken those away. Um, but you know, for us Africa is just really a sensory experience. Paul has traveled all over South Africa, speaking to NGOs and private nature preserves as he tried to get a grasp on the needs that conservationists have. From animal rehabilitation preserves like Sand Wild to the anti-poaching units like the Black Mambas. Where are we losing the battle? And how do we win? Because the poachers are really high tech these days, you're saying. Yeah, and it's, it's a very, very well-oiled syndicate, the poaching industry. Um, they know exactly what they do, when and how to do it. Um, I would say almost military skill-like. Wow. Really. The people you find on the ground doing the poaching, it's only the, the bottom line of the pyramid. Yeah. It's being well structured and delegated from above. So they're actually the guys just doing the job. So surely the education of people is quite important to go that you know, this is the livelihood of a lot of people in the area. Yeah, but on the other hand, it's such a lucrative market for them. Yeah. It can make X amount of money for a night's work. And that will sometimes be more than you could make in a year's time. Usually what they do, they will try to see the pattern there is yeah. on the farm, movement-wise, that's where we can change the game. There mustn't be a routine visible for them from the outside, okay. because they do scouting. They see you first, they will be such fire. It's, it's a, it's a full-blown war, it's a war. 
On their side of the war, poachers are using technologies as a weapon, deploying advanced optics and tracking technology to hunt their prey. And as the age-old poaching industry modernizes, so must Africa. By leveraging everything from machine learning algorithms, streaming HD cameras running image recognition, and even blockchain technologies, Paul is looking to raise awareness and deepen the connection to these animals in order to dismantle the economics of poaching. The poaching seems to be a, a major problem. Yeah, poaching has been driven by demand. Um, and there's been many sort of uh, attempts to, to stop it. Um, personally, I don't think there's a silver bullet. You know, this, is, this process is going to take a generation. Um, it's going to start with the education. Up to 30% of the communities are employed by the lodges. And once those animals go, there's no, there's no employment. We know mostly about poaching about rhinos and elephants for their, their horns and their tusks. Yeah. But apparently there's a lot of poaching going on for food as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I think, again, from the research we've done, you know, you, you've got to put yourself in their, their shoes. You know, if someone's hungry and, and there's no, and there's no um, jobs, you're going to go and poach for food. Mm. And you know, one animal can last you a month. So as much as you want to try and stop the poachers and catch them, it's, it's not solving the problem. You know, we want to try and find a way that we can create jobs or just an income into those communities. And if you can do that, you're solving the problem at the source. Yeah. We spend some time with the black mumbers and speaking to them, they sort of, the people on the, on the ground know what the problems are. Uh, the black mumbers anti-poaching unit, it's 33 young women. They come from local communities uh, under Kruger National Park. So Black Mambas Anti-Poaching Unit, it's the women who go inside the bush to protect our wildlife. They don't carry guns because we don't want to take life. We're here to protect life of wild animals. And on the other hand, we're here to protect life of human beings. We are the eyes and the ears of the reserves. When we go out to patrol, we have our walkie-talkie radio and then we have our smartphone. If we see rhinos, we take pictures so we know where to patrol at night. If we find the holes under the fence, we close the holes. But what's bigger is they actually go into the community and they go into the schools and they talk to the, to the girls and sort of say, you know, there is another option for you. People in our communities, they believe that wildlife is for white people. Well, it's totally wrong. Wildlife, it's for all of us. We go to schools to teach young children about nature. When they go home, these kids, they educate their parents. So Africa basically connects people that would like to donate to groups like Black Mambas. And, and so you basically use sort of the platform for exposing what they do. Exactly. What we want to do is we've got NGOs on the ground doing great work with a great story and millions of people who, who want to help but don't know the story. Yeah. So we really just want to connect the two. And millennials have just overtaken the baby boomers as the largest group or demographic of, of uh, donors. Okay. And millennials have grown up where they want to go directly to the source. So they expect that when they give to NGOs as well. What we want to do by telling the story of the NGO and using blockchain to show where your money is going. So an NGO has very sort of defined needs. They need petrol, they need drones, they need equipment, mm -hmm. very defined things where, they, where the funding will go. And by using blockchain and creating a community, we create trust. If we can be the, the tool or the platform to get that funding to these NGOs, we think that that is the solution of making conservation sustainable. We really talked here about the big five, but there must be an interest in, uh, in a much broader set of animals. Um, as a side sort of thing, we, we've had a lot of birders contact us and um, we've seen a huge demand for people to sort of, um, using AI, identify the birds at the waterhole. So we've actually been talking to, to um, Amazon's um, engineers and we're busy sort of trying to develop a way to edit every single waterhole. Um, you know, it, it'll isolate the bird calls and then put little bubble, bubbles up, actually sort of showing which birds they are. Okay. And um, the bird has sort of test themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can go through a process where you can listen to the feed. Um, you can try and guess what the birds are, and then you can test your knowledge. Yeah. So it almost becomes sort of like a learning tool. And, and, and these are all suggestions we've been getting from, um, from birders around the world. It's interesting because I think 
quite a few of the technologies that we have at Amazon are really demonstrated. You know, these audio and video streams are no longer things to be, only to be listened or watched. They become data streams to become analyzed. You can almost create a, a wiki on each animal, but it's done by AI. Yeah. Um, you know, because we want to, you know, education is one of the big sort of pillars that, you yeah. know, that we want to push. And I'm sure by using AI, you know, if we can identify the animals on the camera, an animal, an elephant could walk into one of our cameras and could say, yeah, it's a big tusker, yeah. his name's Ernie. Um, you know, these are his last sightings, this is yeah. how old he is, you know, and it really, again, it, it engages the user. So I think that could work really, really well. Yeah. Using AI in many different places to augment the user experience, to identify animals and things like that. Is there also a role for AI to actually help the anti-poaching units? For sure, you know, if you look at um, the way technology and especially hardware is going, you know, at the end of the day, the poacher and the anti-poaching people are going to have the same hardware. So the real difference is going to be the AI. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need to be one step ahead of them. You know, we went with the Black Mumbas and some other sort of poaching units. And the one thing that they told us is they never do the same route twice so that the poachers can't see their routine. But they never know whether the route they're doing is effective. So if you can sort of know the movement of the animals, bring in other factors like the climate and the weather, AI can start predicting their movements, which then sort of makes the anti-poaching's movements and patrols more effective. How do you prevent the po poachers actually take the same approach or get access to the data that you have? It has to be encrypted. Even with the with the pictures that rangers take, yeah. you have to strip off the um, GPS coordinates and things like that. That's where sort of encryption yeah. and putting things into the cloud becomes vitally important. This sort of war against poaching is not going to be one with the hardware, it's going to be one in the cloud. At a point in history where we've largely disconnected ourselves from the natural world, technologists like Paul plan to put us back in. Currently, an immoral and illegal trade in wild animal parts is driving some of the most majestic creatures on the planet into extinction. Paul wants to bring everyone to the bush, leveraging a set of straightforward yet powerful technologies. He wants to put us next to the elephant, the leopard and the rhino. He wants the market to demand that the natural world lives. He wants us to demand it. It's just that, a simple problem of supply and demand. If Paul can connect us to these animals and their habitat, our demand that they be preserved will hopefully get louder than the criminals who buy rhino horn, lion skeletons and elephant ivory on the black market. To see the plight of the natural world as our own, that we needed to thrive, to reconnect to that truth. That is what Afrikan hopes to achieve. <laughs>